Good morning. Let's pray. Our Father, help us not to take for granted the fact that you have spoken so clearly to us, not just of your greatness and wisdom in the creation, uh, not just through the prophets, but through your Son, you've shown yourself to us. You've done great things for us. We pray that by your Holy Spirit this morning, we would see them afresh, see them more clearly, and go on our way rejoicing. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you for those who prayed, uh, both for me as I went down to Melbourne uh, for a 24-hour hit, and also for the Adams as they had their commissioning yesterday to go back to East Timor for the fourth time. It's terrific when the missionaries can go back so many times. And um, um, it was just good to be part of that commissioning service down there. But of course, I, when I got back, I thought an awful lot of the um, what happened down there was to do with promises and sort of covenants, but not quite. Uh, so, for example, when they asked me to go down and speak, at one level I didn't want to go down to Melbourne, I had a busy week, but at another level, it's always fun to get down to Melbourne, Paris of the South, but um, I promised. Uh, I had to work out how to get down there, it seemed easier to fly than to drive, but I booked a ticket on Friday because I promised to be at the church at 10am, and if the only flight before that was cancelled, I wouldn't be able to get there, and I promised to be there. So I thought in terms of just keeping my promise, I needed to go on Friday, which was fun. Uh, how was I going to get from the airport? Well, Chris Adam had promised that he would pick me up. I had not the least bit of anxiety as I went down there that he would pick me up from the airport. Uh, and he did. Uh, all these things are promises. How did I know the plane would let me on? Well, that was a different relationship because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a promise. To, um, but I actually had some legal paperwork that indicated we'd entered into a, a contract, a serious agreement, a covenant. But frankly, I was more doubtful of the airline than I was of Chris. Um, and I'd worked out how long it would take me to drive, just in case something went wrong, only a mere six or seven hours. Just in case. Because when you make a promise, particularly if you're a Christian, it's one of the things that you don't realise when you become a Christian, oh, I hadn't even thought it would impact that. But because God is a God who makes and keeps promises and we are his children, we're to be like him. And I don't know if this is helpful or unhelpful, but some of you will know that the Quran is quite clear on the fact that Allah is the, is the greatest of deceivers. Um, it, it's, it's a thing that they're un, unembarrassed about. Well, that is simply not what the God of the scriptures is like. Uh, deception is not his game. He makes and keeps promises he makes him into covenant sometimes, which is sort of formalised uh, contract sort of thing, not to help him keep his promise, but to help us be more assured because we are used to people making and breaking promises and we ourselves do it sometimes, sometimes accidentally and sometimes quite deliberately. We've been looking at these covenants that God makes. The most basic one in some ways, it's not the first, is the one with Abraham, you know all this, it's unilateral. He then, on top of that, builds secondary covenants with Israel at Mount Sinai. That's the one that's bilateral. It's like a marriage. Both make promises in it. And then, as you heard last week, we looked at the fact that God pr promises the new covenant. So this is the second, uh, exploring what's new about the new covenant. Because I think it's fair to say it's not always entirely clear. Because there's massive continuity from the old covenant, the Old Testament, into the new but there is also a significant difference, as you heard uh, read for this from uh, Hebrews 8, which quotes Jeremiah 31. And this is of no great significance, I don't think, but it is the longest quote in the New Testament from the Old Testament, where it quotes quite a few verses from Jeremiah 31, explaining what's new about the New Covenant. And if you're a Christian, you live in the New Covenant. So this is describing what is distinctive about your relationship with God because of the work of Jesus Christ. As we've been noting and rejoicing in that God bothers to make and cares to keep his promises. It's a wonderful thing to have secure promises about what he will do and what he won't do. But we're told very clearly that Jesus institutes a new covenant. 
Uh, Let me read you from Hebrews 8, verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is a superior to theirs. Who's the theirs? It's the old, it's the the prophets, the priests um, in the old covenant, in the temple that God had set up. So they were they were his, you know, they were his idea. But Jesus is doing something superior. In fact, the ministry of Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as is the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old covenant since the new covenant is established on better promises. So what we've got in Jesus and the new covenant is something better, similar, but better, quite distinct, and yet with those uh, levels of similarity. The great promise in the middle of them is, I will be your God, you will be my people. It's, it's bringing that reality to pass. Now, the, the Bible is it's a story in two parts. And many of us come to Christ, come to God through the New Testament. Jesus, which is, makes perfectly good sense. That's an obvious way. And then we discover that we're in the second act of a play. Now, if you go and see a play, and I think I um, went and saw a while ago Macbeth in the city, and um, I think that's in two acts. And uh, if you only watch the first act, it'll be fairly unsatisfactory because the questions are raised, but they're not resolved. And sometimes in a good story, it's hard to say how on earth things can be resolved. And the worst of all writers in the universe finish up by saying, and then I woke up and it was all a dream. If that isn't the way a loser writes, uh, because if someone who's 12 writes, that's okay. But I've actually read books. And, this is exciting. How are they going to resolve this in one page? And then I woke up. You dirty rat. But if you get to the end of the first act, there's things. And if you get to the end of the Old Testament, there are things that are clearly not resolved. Uh, so there's this whole sacrifice thing set up, very serious and solemn, to somehow rather deal with sin. But even within the Old Testament, I say, how can the blood of bulls and goats deal with my sin? It's not, you know, it's not a fair substitute in any way, shape or form. And yet human sacrifice is forbidden. Uh, there are all sorts of... Qu- How's this going to work? With the, if, you, if you've ever been to a Jewish family holding the Passover, they leave the door open. Right? Part of it is, is for Elijah to come. Right? They're waiting for something to happen that they think hasn't yet happened. But then if you start just in the New Testament, uh, say if you come to say the, just the second act of Macbeth, uh, you, you, get a, you can kind of work it out. It's better just to see the second act than just the first act, I suggest. Uh, Because you can kind of work out some of what's going on. And if you just arrive at Christianity through the New Covenant and don't familiarise yourself with the Old Covenant, there's a whole lot of stuff I think will just be a little fragile. And you wonder, why is that happening? But if you've been brought through the whole educative process of the Old Covenant, oh, I can understand. That makes sense. So part of deepening our life with God is to realise that the first covenant is the first movement. It's the first act. And um, I do like the, the um, thing they sometimes teach in Sunday school because in the end the whole thing is about Jesus. Jesus says that, that the Old Testament speaks of him. And you, some of you all have learnt this. The Old Testament, the part before Jesus, is Christ predicted. The four Gospels are Christ revealed. The book of Acts is Christ proclaimed. The letters, the epistles, we're looking at one here, Hebrews 8, that is Christ explained, the significance. And then the book of Revelation is Christ expected. The whole book is about him. But we're going to look particularly at what's different about the second part. And Hebrews 8 is as good a place to go as any. That the ministry that Christ has brought, like the covenant he's brought, is superior. It's better. In what ways? Two ways. We looked at one. We majored on one last week when we looked at Jesus' words as he sets up the Lord's Supper for us, uh, his death, his blood, and it was about forgiveness. And you can see that here in chapter 8. It finishes in verse 13, uh, sorry, verse 12. I, this is part of the promise of the new covenant. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will rem- remember their sins no more. Now, if you go to chapter 9, where he begins to, he continues this discussion in chapter 10, he's explaining about how Christ's sacrifice is better than any before it. And he summarizes again what he thinks, what God thinks, or the Holy Spirit thinks, he says in verse 15, 
is special about the new covenant. Let me read you from 10, 15. The Holy Spirit also testified to us about this. And he first says, this is the covenant I'll make with you. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I'll remember no more. So we looked at that strange thing where God promises that he will forget. And we do need to remember, as we looked last week, and not forget that God forgets. When he forgives your sins, they're gone. You haven't done them. He's not interested. Right? He chooses to forget. And one of, the, one of the marks of growing up as a Christian and growing deeper as a Christian is increasingly believing that so you can rejoice in it. So you're not rejoicing in your goodness. I'm such a good person. But he is such a wonderful God that no matter how vile that one sin was or those hundreds of sins or that sin I just can't seem to get the better of, he is well able to forgive and forget. I had a, a man stay in that place once when I was a youth worker. That was my first encounter with a person like this. He needed money, stayed with us, and I went out and foolishly left money in my top drawer of my desk, and he nicked it. And I thought, oh, well, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have left it there, really. And um, anyhow, he rang me back about two hours later, and I was pleased to hear his voice. You know, that, uh, and he, he was so apologetic. I didn't know then, but he, was a, he had an, uh, an addiction to gambling. And he'd taken the money and had a bit and lost it. Um, but he, he was so boring because he was like what we are with God. He kept saying, I'm so, oh, I'm so, I said, it's okay. I wanted to shout down the phone, enough already, you know. I meant it when I said, it, you know, it's forgiven, forgotten. We all make mistakes, right. And, and then I went out. I had lived in a tiny little house on a huge long block that eventually the developers got and turned it into 70,000 units, I think. And... Um, I used to go behind this sort of hedgy thing and would sometimes have a bit of a quiet time with God there. And I was going on to God uh, about some sin. I can't remember what it was now, but the, the, I was thinking, I can't believe I've done that. And, um, and I didn't see then the exact parallel between me and God, only worse in a sense, than me and this guy Dave who'd nicked the money. Um, but I had... I had a strange moment. I said to God, please, please forgive, please forgive me. And I had a, some of the promises open in front of me. And um, I kind of, it was like a voice inside my head. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter what it was. But I'm saying, God, please forgive me. And I felt this voice say to me, I have. I don't know. And then I said, but I don't feel forgiven. And this voice in the middle of my head said, so What? Now, I don't know if that was God or not. Uh, if you think you hear God speaking to you saying, yes, I want you to steal this, or yes, I want you to commit adultery with this person, that is not the voice of God. I can assure you that. But I, you know, I was quite taken by just how blunt um, whatever that was, was it. So what? So don't forget, please honour God by rejoicing in your forgiveness. Secondly, in various ways, it uses these words, doesn't it? I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. God forgives. Beautiful shelter to live under and to revel in. But then he does something inside of us, in our hearts, our souls, our minds, that the deep parts of who we are as human beings. Let me read you again, that apart from this quote in Hebrews 8, about this better covenant, and because he quotes... Jeremiah 31, which we've heard a number of, I think this is the third time we've heard um, parts from Jeremiah 31, because a very important part of God's old covenant. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, it's his idea, with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. So he wants us to know it's a covenant, but it's, there's something radically different about it. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them in their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For... 
I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling the covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So that the two parts, forgiveness and a work inside. See, where is the law of God when, you come out, when, when the Israelites come out from Egypt? It's on the stone tablets. It's a huge privilege. God has made really clear what he thinks is right and wrong. And only a, an arrogant fool argues with God about right and wrong. And just because it's worth remembering, the heart of wickedness, according to the Bible, is not murder or some particular sin. It is the arrogance that says to God, you will not tell me what's right and wrong. I will decide what's right and wrong. That is the heart and soul of evil. So you can be quite a nice person and radically evil. If you listen to your culture, at various points you will express that radical wickedness where you will say to God, no, yeah, I, I know you say that, and, and some of these weird conservative Christians think that, but no, no, no. Every culture does it in very, very, very different areas. But it's the heart and soul of sin. Right? It's the arrogance against God. We do need forgiveness for that. But we need to have not just the law of God outside. This is what, in the end, what went wrong in the old covenant was the people went wrong. They just couldn't seem to do it in spite of their frequent promises. So what God says is right. In Jeremiah 31, 700 years or so before Jesus, he promises, not a covenant, but he promises a new covenant will come. And then in Jesus, he says when he's in Luke 22, this blood, bring it in the new covenant, forgiveness and the law goes from being outside only to being inside as well. New heart, law written in the mind and the soul. The problem is a heart, which is ironic, isn't it, in our culture where we're told, follow your heart. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a place for that in terms of working out what to do. It's right to work out, what, you know, what do I love doing? But that is not our guide. The heart, the human heart in the Bible has seemed to be a dangerous thing. Right? Uh, it's complicated. But just the idea of my heart tells me it's right. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, is what God says. But here the promise is that God will do something in our hearts. Now let me just read a number of verses. This will be, you'll have to stay with us. So Jeremiah 31, you've already heard. Um, let me read you what God says a chapter later in chapter 32 of Jeremiah, verse 38. Listen, there's, there's a theme going on in these verses. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear and that all will go well with them. They will always fear me and that all will go well with them. Verse 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. Now, the fear of God, as you know, we've, we've mentioned this before, it's like what you have towards electricity. Right? Electricity is a huge blessing, isn't it? It's hard to imagine life without electricity, lights, sound systems, all sorts of things. And yet it'll kill you. Right? If you're careless, you make a mistake. So we have, most people have what could be described as a, as a fear of electricity. It just means you treat it carefully. Right? You know that to, with little children, we, you put those weird things into PowerPoints and you, you don't let them play with forks and things like that. Right? Because you fear it. And that's the basic sense of the fear. It's a deep respect for something. It's wonderful. But you've got to treat it properly. And God is like that. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's in the Old Covenant. It's in the New Covenant. Jesus is very clear. I'll tell you who to fear, he says. Fear him who after death can throw you into hell. So the idea that the fear of God is an Old Testament thing, all that sort of silly talk that we do, it is an Old Testament thing, but it's a very Jesus thing as well. That deep respect. And he, what God says here is, I will work it in your heart. I will work inside of you. So that you instinctively begin to take the right attitude towards God of both trust and fear and respect. Let me take you back to Ezekiel. There are similar things in Deuteronomy that we won't go to just for because of time. Let me read you two things from Ezekiel. Prophet about the same time, a tiny bit after Jeremiah. Here's what God says. Chapter 11, verse 19. I will give them an undivided heart. I will give them 
and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people. I will be their God. See, so he says, I will, I'll take out, he'll do a heart transplant. He'll take out the stony heart that is quite hard and harsh against the word of God and replace a soft and tender heart. I'll put a new spirit within them that will move them. So we'll begin to take the right attitudes to God of respect and trust as the Holy Spirit does his work. And then, of course, the other passage that I know some of you will have looked at in your life groups from Ezekiel 36, which is very similar to the Jeremiah 31 New Covenant one, but it doesn't use the word New Covenant, but it's very clearly talking out exactly the same thing. And it just this is the beauty of God as a communicator. He uses multiple images to convey the one thing. One might get you, this one may get someone else, but together we get the richness of it. Listen to what God promises here. From Ezekiel 36, verse 25. I will, that's covenant language, I will, I will, I will. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. It's another way of talking about forgiveness. I'll sprinkle clean water on you, you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. See, here's why you've got a hope. I know when you stand outside Christian and think, I can't possibly learn to be loving and generous and forgiving and sexually disciplined and whatever else. I can't do it. Right? Right. But he can change your heart. He specialises in doing it. He can empower you to change in a way that on your own you simply couldn't. So we have this sort of protective thing of forgiveness and the work of the Holy Spirit inside us, transitioning and changing us as we go. Um, many of you will have heard of Dr. Christian Barnard. What's he famous for? A heart transplant. First guy did that. South African. Who could imagine? But he did. Um, and he, he was amazing. That's a joke, okay? See, I've, I've elevated South Africans up to New Zealanders. You know, that's... A, but, um, but the third person he did that to was a guy called Dr. Philip Blayberg, who was a dentist. And because they were both sort of medical-ish, they were having a bit of a chat after his heart transplant. And then Dr. Barnard said, would you like to see your old heart? And Dr. Blayberg said, yes. So they wandered off to some laboratory and he, and he didn't have it wrapped in glad wrap sitting on the desk. He just, he had it in a jar with some fluid on it, in it and, and he, gave it to, he gave it to him. So they, they say that Dr. Philip Blayberg is the first human ever to hold his own heart in his hand. Right? And they had a bit of a discussion. They pointed out the parts that were wrong, etc., etc. And then Dr. Blayberg said, his final words to his heart was, so he said, so this is my old heart that has caused me so much trouble. And he just gave it back to him and walked out and never saw it again. Because the human heart, this is, this is the thing. Our heart is addicted to things it shouldn't be. It's got habits, it's built up over years that can be very difficult to break. And what God is saying, I will do a work in your heart. The law will not just be outside, but I'll put it inside your heart. So you will love it from the inside. You'll be changed from the inside. You'll be transformed. And that's the great verse in Romans 12, isn't it? That we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God is doing something to us and within us. It's not just a question of those who are, who've got sort of good self-discipline can make it. But God will change us. But the, the difficulty is we almost don't notice it sometimes. So we begin to change in our attitude towards Jesus. Change in our attitudes towards the Bible. Change in our attitudes to those others who follow Jesus. These things, we just almost don't become aware of some of these things. And we begin to be changed slowly over time. And it is what God is promising to do. We still need the constant protection of forgiveness because we make many falls as we grow and as we change. I think I've shared once before, and I do this to God's uh, credit, not mine, but um, after I became a Christian, which was a bit of a shock to all of us at the time, my uh, then girlfriend said to me, she was trying to get me to calm down, I thought I was being a bit of a fanatic. She said, do you know what your fr other friends are saying about you? I said, no, what are they saying? She said, they're saying, the old Ian's dead. He's not around anymore. I was so excited. 
because all I was aware of is I don't think I'm hardly changed. I think I'm the worst Christian in the universe. And, um, and it was just so lovely to hear that they had, I don't, even, I don't know what they'd seen that changed, but it was lovely, and that's God. God does these transitions. My, my father, um, he became a Christian after me. I didn't help him. In fact, it's a miracle that he became a Christian after I did. But uh, we were sitting at the dining room table, and uh, there was just mum, dad, and me. I was the youngest. There was only one at home at that stage. And um, we were having an argument, which we tended to do in year 12. I, I, I kind of thought I hated my father. I don't think I did, but I, 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 he was a horrible, horrible man. And, um, and we, had a, we had an argument, and I, I was winning the argument. Our family had six popes. My mother wasn't a pope, but the rest of us were all infallible in arguments. And... Um, Anyhow, we had this argument, and I'm sure I can't remember what it was about, but I, I was winning the argument. And I said to the, my father, I said, you're wrong, aren't you? You're wrong, and you know you're wrong. You know you're wrong. I know you're wrong. Mum knows you're wrong. Let me hear you say those words. Come on. Let me hear you say the words, I'm wrong. You can't, can you? You are incapable of admitting the obvious that you're wrong. And I, I once shared this when I was at that boys' school. And it was surprising how many of the boys said, that's what drives me nuts about my father too. But um, so uh, anyhow, I don't know what exactly happened, but after a while there was a bit of a scuffle between my father and I. He had my arm up behind me. Mum's whacking on his arm saying, don't, don't break his arm. And I ran away from home for a couple of days. That was fun. But, um, uh, but the, I tell you that because this, after he became a Christian, as an older man... He was helping us move at one stage. And he, w he just was being bossy. That's the sort of, he, was, uh, he was an only child. He was a very successful man, blah, blah, blah. And um, so he did what he did instinctively and quite clever. And at one point I said, Dad, look, I really appreciate your help, but you've got to stop you know, acting as if this is your house. And, this is, you know, we, we, and he nearly killed me because he said, oh, I'm sorry. Of course it is. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. I nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it. It was impossible. But it wasn't. Now, all sorts of things can happen in the person's life. But I have no doubt it was part of the great change that was going on in my father. In many areas, he didn't change. He was a very moral man, very honest man, hardworking man, generous in some ways, but proud as anything. And it was just, and that is what God does over time. But because it's growth, often we don't notice it in, in, you know, day by day by day. But God will transform us. That's what he promises in 2 Corinthians, where it talks about the spirit, that we are being transformed daily, glory to glory. This is what God, this is the essential part of the new covenant, this great work that God does on the inside. So when you're praying about your Christian life, it's not just about how you act, but you pray for the Holy Spirit to be more and more freely at work in your heart, that he would bear his fruit in your life. This is what God wants to do. A work on the inside, not merely on the outside. So um, I have sometimes suggested to my wife that she's a reptile and I'm a mammal. Uh, the reason is because sometimes she feels the cold more than I do. And uh, it's partly because I've got huge amounts of padding like a polar bear. But um, I say, I'm a, you know, mammals can keep themselves warm from the inside. Reptiles need to lie in the sun. They can't do it. And a Christian is more like a mammal than a reptile. Right? Uh, if you like things in the Old Covenant New Covenant, they were reptiles. Magnificent. But God is doing something by his spirit inside that transforms us in that way. So we're brought into this New Covenant which has these two great features. Wonderful, perfect forgiveness, unthinkably deep and good, and also the work of the Holy Spirit to cause us to walk in his ways, to transform us. Some people, when they become Christians, you can see it instantly. I had one young man I saw become a Christian. I'd seen him in the afternoon. I saw him the next day. I knew as he walked across the playground, he'd become a Christian. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. Most people aren't like that. Um, most of us it's a slow progressive change growth is the word the Bible uses so it's a thing to rejoice in if, if your faith is in Jesus you're a member of the new and better covenant right? that's what Christ brings 
to rejoice in it, to be thankful, not to be contemptuous of the old covenant. Uh, some of you will know there was, a, the, there was a, a guy called Marcion in the early church, about 200 years after Jesus, who took a dislike to the Jews. And so what he did was he went through and anything that was tied up with Jewishness, he scrapped. Uh, so the Old Testament. Uh, any of the parts of the New Testament where, which clearly honour the Old Testament, like Hebrews and all sorts of chapters, he scrapped them. And the early Christian leaders had to get together and say, no, 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 that's, that's not what we're like. Uh, so, but some Christians even today are, are a bit like Marcion. Oh, Old Testament, no, no, no. It's, it, we've got to grow to work out how, what, what flows through and what doesn't. But God set up the Old Covenant and God set up the New Covenant. It's a great blessing to be in either, but it's a special joy to be part of the New Covenant. So that's where Jesus is taking us to in these agreements, not just promises, formalized promises, covenants or contracts, forgiveness and the work of the Holy Spirit changing us, transforming us, renovating us, restoring us, pointing us to Jesus. So the, the great power of God is gently, quietly at work inside us, changing us from the inside out. I hope that's helpful. Let's pray. Father, we again happily acknowledge that your ways are not our ways. Thank you for your grace and mercy in saving the Israelites. Thank you for your patience over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of their rebellion and defiance. But thank you, Father, for the new and better covenant brought to us by Jesus, the great mediator, for his blood shed that we can be forgiven and for the reward of the Holy Spirit for all his children. Please work more and more in us this week that we would be changed and transformed to be more like Christ. We pray this for his glory and we pray it thankfully. Amen.